Hi, in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about performance assessments. So what is a performance assessment? A performance assessment is when a teacher observes and makes a, a judgment about a student's performance, right? So that could be a performance like a presentation, but it could also be a product like um, a poster or a diorama or a traditional project. Um, we also sometimes call performance assessments alternative assessments. So when we think of alternative assessment, we're thinking of an alternative to a traditional assessment. Um, I don't love that term because I think it's confusing if we think back to our, our um, discussion of reliability and we have um, alternate forms of the same assessment. So I think alternative assessment is a confusing term, but you'll also often hear principals and administrators refer to performance assessments as alternative assessments. So I want you to be familiar with that term. And then remember, we also have authentic assessments. And authentic assessments are a type of performance assessment in which you're assessing an authentic task, something that would have to do with a real world situation. Our next lecture will go into more depth with authentic assessments. So some characteristics of performance assessments. Um, it's when students are doing something. They're creating, they're performing, they're constructing, they're producing. Um, we're really assessing deep understanding. So when we start to talk about the types of objectives or learning targets for performance assessments, we're really thinking about those deep understandings, those things we couldn't assess in other ways. Um, it consists of sustained work. So this should consist of days or even weeks of work. Um, that are engaging in ideas of importance and substance. If we're going to spend weeks or days sustained work on something, then it should be something that's truly important and integral to your content area. Um, it should rely on trained assessors to judge or assess this work, so it shouldn't be something that you could just grade with a multiple choice test. It should really take expertise in order to evaluate this work. And there, therefore, there shouldn't be a single correct answer, but you should be relying on multiple ways in which a student could approach the problem and ways in which they could come up with a result. So why would we do a performance assessment? What are the strengths of performance assessment? Um, there's a close tie to instruction, that this learning occurs during the assessment. So remember at the beginning of the semester, I asked you to recall a traditional assessment that you took in elementary school, and you probably couldn't really think of a specific test you took, right? But if I asked you to recall a project you did, you can probably think of a couple, right? That's because the learning stuck with you. The learning that we do in performance assessments is deep, rich, and lasting. So that learning that's occurring during an assessment here, this learning that's happening during these performance assessments is deep, rich, and lasting. It has this close tie to instruction. Um, it also allows us to provide feedback throughout the task. When a student takes a test, you can't in the middle of the test be like, oh, wait, look at number three. I'm not sure you did that right. Like That would defeat the purpose of the assessment. But during a performance assessment, along the way, as students are, are formulating their ideas, as they're working on this, you as a teacher can come alongside them. You can provide scaffolding. You can help redirect misunderstandings. You can even provide additional challenges for students who may be finishing earlier who have already mastered the material. Um, it also allows students to justify their thinking. So you can allow students to really take that evaluative step to think about why am I answering this way? How am I coming up with this answer? Why and what supports the decisions that I'm making? Um, it's also, I want us to go back to our theories of assessment. We can really say that performance assessment might be based upon constructivism in the sense that the students are constructing their own answers. They're taking what they know, they're taking their schema, and they're building upon that. It's also closely linked to what we call project-based learning or PBL. This is a movement within education in which um, a true PBL school would have all of their assessments be project-based rather than the traditional assessments that we traditionally see in schools. Um, I'm not a big fan of only using one type of anything. I think that having a lot of tools in our toolkit as teachers is helpful, but I am a big fan of project-based learning in the sense that I think that this is a really powerful tool to have in our tool belt. So if you ever get a chance to tour at a project-based learning school or learn more about it, I think that it would be a really benefit to you. 
you know, as a teacher, as a beginning teacher, as an intern to really investigate and see what all of this is about. So what are some limitations? Why don't we do more performance assessments in schools? Um, reliability. Why is reliability an issue with performance assessments? Hopefully you thought about a couple of things. You thought about inter-rater reliability, this idea that because it's so subjective, we're not, we might have differences in the ways in which people would assess an individual project. So there wouldn't be a lot of reliability between assessments, which might be a limitation to implementing this large scale. If we're making really important decisions based upon these performance assessments, we would want to make sure that we had strong reliability, that we could really count on um, consistency among assessors or among ourselves as assessors over time. Um, sampling. If we're thinking about item sampling, how much can we really cover with one performance assessment? We're not going to get the breadth of um, assessment that we could get from a, from a large a number of multiple choice items. So as teachers, we really need to be strategic in our performance assessments and try to bring in as many of the standards as we can into those performance assessments so that we can try to um, assess as many different parts of our curriculum at once within these really well-developed projects, but that can be difficult. Um, and finally, time. We kind of alluded to this already, that it takes sustained time, sustained effort among, among students to really create a quality performance assessment. And a lot of times, given the breadth of things that we're supposed to be covering in the curriculum, um, if we look at these curriculum guides districts give us, if we look at the standards we're supposed to be covering as teachers, we don't often have that luxury of time. I'll make the... the um, argument that by combining standards together we're getting rich deep learning and um, project-based learning or performance assessments can be an effective way at learning lots of things and by using our time effectively however we're always as teachers going to be kind of faced with this do we have enough time to really do this effectively there's also the issue of time to grade um, and as a teacher, our time is limited, and certainly performance assessments take longer to assess than other types of assessments in class. Okay, so what types of learning objectives or learning targets should we be using for performance assessments? And then we'll look at a couple of them. Um, the first one is deep understanding. So we should be assessing a deep understanding. If I'm just having a knowledge-based, surface-level comprehension type of, type of learning targets, I can assess those better using a traditional test, using multiple choice or even fill in the blank, right? Um, there should be meaningful involvement, the types of things that could be used, hands-on activities, extended periods of time, where I really want students to demonstrate those subtleties of meaning. Um, if I'm thinking about learning targets, I can think about reasoning, um, types, of types of projects where I'm asking students to construct, to use reasoning skills to construct those, um, those problem solving, making decisions. This is going to tie a lot to those authentic real life tasks we ask them to do. So it should be more than um, draw a picture of George Washington, right? So I see this all the time like in elementary school. It's President's Day, right? And so I go down the hallway and there's an entire hallway full of drawings of George Washington where students have cut out his face and glued it onto a sheet of paper. And I'm like, great. They learned how to cut and glue, which is not unimportant for kindergartners, but have they really learned very much about George Washington and President's Day? Probably not. I'm not going to say that that was a meaningful performance assessment that the kindergartners or first graders did about President's Day, right? Uh, if I really want them to understand who George Washington was for President's Day, I need them to do a task where they're really going to be thinking about George Washington as a person, right? So thinking about how can I increase that learning, that problem solving, those deeper objectives, right? Um, and then we can think about the types of cognitive processes that we would want to be seeing, whether that's analysis or synthesis. When I say synthesis, what I really mean is um, putting ideas together to create something new. 
Um, critical thinking. I think critical thinking is one of those um, words we use in education. It's like a buzzword we use all the time. But what do we really mean by critical thinking? We're talking about those higher order thinking skills. We're talking about those analysis skills. We're asking students to think deeply about a topic in a way that's not surface level. Um, inference, um, that's the idea of taking um, a lot of a lot of observations and making a generalization. You see generalization over there later. So we tend to use the word inference when we're talking about things in language arts. We tend to use the word generalization when we're talking about things like in science. But those are almost the same idea, right? So thinking across curricularly, what types of skills are we using, right? prediction, hypothesis testing, um, all of those higher level skills are really um, the types of things we should be thinking about and we're thinking about performance assessments. Um, we also want to think about when we're asking students to do performance assessments, we're asking them to do these higher level thinking skills, but we're also asking them to do some, some actual skills, right? And we want to make sure that we've taught these skills prior to the performance assessments. So let me give you some examples. So if they're giving a presentation, then there's communication and presentation skills we're asking them to do. So if they're um, giving a speech, they have oral presentation skills they need. If we haven't taught those skills to students, we are going to have a really boring couple of days where kids are giving presentations, right? And I know you guys have sat through really terrible student presentations, right? So if we want that to be a dynamic time, if we want students to do well on their speeches, we need to teach them those oral presentation skills, right? And we want to think about how can I help students do this better? The same goes for if I'm making students make posters. Have I taught them graphic design skills to make their posters good? And that can be very simple, but we want to make sure that we've gone over the things that, we, that make those presentations look good right? If it's a PowerPoint, if it's a speech, if it's a poster, if it's, I'm trying to think of other things students do, a diorama, a sculpture, whatever it is, we want to make sure that we've taught students how to do that well. Um, again, psychomotor skills, creation of things, we really want to make sure that we've taught them the underlying skills to help them with that performance assessment and detailed what it looks like to be successful in this. I think a lot of times we forget this step and then we're disappointed in the products the students make or the presentations they give. We want to make sure that we cannot assume that even in high school students have these skills. And a lot of times, these are important skills for our discipline, right? As an English teacher, is it important? Are oral communication skills important? Absolutely, right? As a history teacher, is it important that students can communicate effectively about history? I think so, right? All of these secondary ancillary skills are also super important for your discipline. Okay, let's talk about products. Again, um, if they're writing a report, if they're doing a paper, we want to make sure that it's engaged. We want to make sure that it's systematically evaluated with a public scoring guide or rubric. We're going to talk more about rubrics in um, the, not the next lecture, the lecture after that, so we'll get a lot more detailed with how we're going to do this. The important thing here to remember is that it's publicly available and that you've shown students how they'll be evaluated prior to them submitting the assignment. And I know that you guys as students appreciate that so that you know how you'll be evaluated prior to that evaluation occurring. We want to do this for our students so that, it, that it's fair and it's valid. And again, we'll talk more about authenticity, but remembering that that authenticity, how it connects to the real world, um, is on a continuum. So let's say that I was a PE teacher assessing basketball. I know, stop laughing. I know, I know. I probably should never be a PE teacher. Um, so I could have, if I want to assess students' basketball skills, right? I could have them explain how to play basketball, right? I could have them show me how to perform some basketball skills like shooting from the free throw, free throw line or dribbling a basketball, right? Or I could have them play a basketball game. Um, obviously, playing the basketball game is the most authentic way to assess their basketball skills and explaining how to play basketball is probably the least authentic way, right? But all of those things assess different skills about basketball, assess different things. So depending on what I'm trying to isolate, what my specific objectives are, I might choose any of these. Um, but if I'm really thinking about authenticity, the last one's the most important, right? Okay. 
Um, so um, when we're thinking about how to create a good performance task, those guidelines, the first thing is we want to make sure that it's the most essential aspect of the content with the most important skills. If we're going to spend time on a performance task, and remember it's sustained effort and time, we want to make sure that we're really concentrating on those really important things. Um, we want to make sure that multiple learning targets are assessed. Again, if we're spending time on this, we want to make sure that there is um, that we're maximizing that time to be effective. Um, we want to structure the task so students can be successful. Um, so that interaction of instruction and assessment. Um, we want to think about our role as a teacher in that scaffolding because we can provide feedback throughout the task on how we can um, ask questions, what resources we should be providing for students or that should be available for students, and how we can provide feedback throughout. Um, we want to think about um, what students should do to make sure that the task is feasible. Mostly what I find for teachers is that um, they don't have a problem making this task feasible. In fact, they kind of go the other way and they kind of limit what students can do. Um, but what resources will they need? Um, and the resources can include a lot of things. It might be um, what types of um, research materials they might need. So whether you're going to pull books from the library or bookmark websites for them, or you're going to ask them to find primary sources or um, interviews with people, thinking about what resources do you want them to use? Are you going to have a requirement for how many they should have? That kind of thing. Um, how much time are you going to give them? Um, I think it's really effective to have projects in which students can only use class time rather than allowing, rather than having them work at home. Um, one of the complications that you have when you um, assign things to work on home is that um, some students will spend more or less time at home and it really um, accentuates the class differences we might have between home environments of students. So we're automatically giving some kids an advantage on that. Um, although at other times, given the limited amount of class time that you have, it might be necessary to use at home time in order to supplement and give kids enough time to complete the task you're asking them to do. Um, you might think about how much are you going to scaffold the steps they need to take in order to be successful. Are you going to have goal points um, or submissions along the way? Like should they submit an outline at some point? Should they submit a, you know, the resources they're going to use at some point? Those types of things. They need to check in with you to make sure that they're on target for completing the task. Okay, the task should allow for multiple solutions. Obviously, um, when we're doing these types of projects and performance tasks, we want to have lots of ways in which the student could approach the problem and could come up with a solution. Um, so they can really personalize the process. They can show you how they are thinking, right? That they can justify and explain their responses. Um, so it's not a set of drill and skill activities. Again, if it was drill and skill, we could do this much more effectively in an easier way to assess. The task should be clear. Um, with an unambiguous set of directions. They should know what the end, what you're looking for and how they'll be assessed, um, even if the problem is messy. So you don't have to tell them how to find the solution um, as long as they know what their goal and objective is. And that this can be tricky to kind of navigate as a teacher. What's the difference between what we call a messy problem and unclear directions. And I think you as students have probably been in this situation where you've had unclear directions and you didn't know what you were supposed to be doing versus times where you knew what you what the goal was even if you weren't sure at the beginning how to solve it. And we want to give students those opportunities to solve problems, but we don't want them to feel like they don't know what they should be doing or what the expectations are. Does that make sense? Okay, we want to have them to have the reason for the task in sufficient detail to know how to proceed, even if we're not giving them step by step. And we should, we don't want to lay out the solutions all the time. We want them to be able to do that problem solving, especially as students are getting more cognitively able to do that. And um, they have the background knowledge in order to solve those problems. Um, the task should be challenging and stimulating to students. If we're going to spend a lot of time on something, we want to make sure it's something the students will continue to be engaged with. Um, to, so they, they're motivated to use their skills and knowledge um, and it's interesting and thought provoking. Um, blending that familiarity with novelty will keep them engaged in a longer amount of time. Um, and that there's explicitly stated scoring criteria, which we'll talk about in a few lectures from now. 
So um, that was my lecture. I hope that you um, understand performance assessments in greater detail now. And as always, if you have questions, please email me. Um, I look forward from here to I look forward to hearing from you. Bye.